This episode of the Flush Podcast is brought to you by North Dakota Tourism. Start planning your fall hunting adventure in North Dakota at legendarynd.com. And by Onyx Hunt, the number one GPS hunting map app. Onyx, know where you stand. Today we're talking rooster road trips with Bob St. Pierre of Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever. Pheasant seasons are now upon us across much of the Midwest, and we're going to give you an idea of what you can expect when you hit the field, as well as a few places that you may want to hunt. Spoiler alert, the bird numbers are up. Welcome to another episode of the Flush Podcast. I'm Travis Frank. I'm your host. Brandon Morton is our producer. And Brandon, I have heard from a little bird that you're going pheasant hunting for the first time. Are you nervous? Excited? Scared? What's going through your mind right now? I am all of those things wrapped up in one. Um, I'm really, really looking forward to it. It's my first time ever like hunting in general of anything. So it's I, I can't wait. It's going to be awesome. Why did you decide to go? What What convinced you? Well, working with these outdoor programs for the past summer has uh, just made me super curious. I've always been curious, but I've never really had the opportunity. I haven't really known a lot of people that hunt. But now I've got all these wonderful people around me that, that can guide me and help me out. So why not take advantage of this opportunity? Yeah. So Tony Jones, the Reverend Hunter, uh, is is another one of the hosts for another podcast that you produce in our in our podcast tree. Um and so Tony's been working on, on getting you out there. I know he, he and I have talked a, a couple times and I unfortunately can't join you. I'm, I'm really bummed, but I'm excited to hear how it goes. Do you, uh, do you have all the gear that you need? I, I'm, 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 acu- I'm, I'm accumulating the gear through people I know. So I've, I've, got, I've got enough stuff and I, I should be good to go. So okay. it's just Are a you- matter of me, uh, me waking up in the morning and being prepared. Gotcha. Do you, are you guys going to break down your first time hunt on his on Tony's podcast next week? Yep, we're going to break it down on the 5th Monday of November. So that would be the 30th. All right. All right. Well, I may ask you a little bit about it next week if you're okay with that. I'm 100% cool with that. <laughs> All right, perfect. Well, good luck to you. Thank you. Uh, I'll be excited to hear how it goes and we'll we'll discuss next week. But now for our guest today, I'm guessing that most of you are not a stranger to Bob St. Pierre. He's the marketing director for Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever. He hosts the Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever podcast called On the Wing in Minnesota. He's a co-host for Fan Outdoors on KFAN. He's been writing stories for the Pheasants Forever Journal for over a decade now. He's all over social media. He's one of the face of the Rooster Road Trips. He's been on our television show, The Flush, several times. He's a regular MC at Pheasants Forever Banquets. Bob, what else am I missing here? <laughs> I do carnival tricks in my spare time, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, you just wrapped up your 2000 or 2020 Pheasants Forever Rooster Road Trip, and that's just one of the reasons that I want to have you on the show. Um <laughs> I'm sure our, our listeners will benefit from hearing what you and your crew found in the field, but really, most importantly, it's hunting season right now, and I wanted to have you on the show because I just really enjoy talking bird hunting with you. How's your season been going so far? I, you know, it's been it's been really terrific. Um, I was I was not out there on September first, but I was out there really really soon after. Um, I think the the very first seasons opened up on September first, but my season started uh, in North Dakota on sharp tails, and I think I was out September twelfth was the opener. Um, then I went to Ely. Uh, Minnesota and hunted the edge of the boundary waters for rough grouse for the Minnesota uh, rough grouse opener. Then I went out to uh, far uh, northwest South Dakota, the Great River National Grasslands. I uh, got back into Sharpies. And then I bounced uh, back east to Wisconsin for my annual rough grouse camp. And then uh, then it was the minis- time for the Minnesota pheasant opener and the rooster road trip. And here we are now. So I've been bouncing around the, the upper Midwest a little bit and 
I've liked what I've seen. That's it? That's all you've done? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you probably traveled even more than I have. So, but, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's a darn good year to mm-hmm. pack as much in as possible okay. because sure. the, the bird numbers really have been um, encouraging everywhere I've been. Mm-hmm. Well, and we're, I'm going to title this episode Rooster Road Trippin' because, and, and maybe it should just be Bird Hunting Road Trippin' because you and I have both been all over uh, bird country for the past month and a half-ish. Um, mm-hmm. And I kind of want to give the listeners an idea of what you're seeing, what I'm seeing, and we can kind of talk through it. You and I both hunt very similarly. We love hunting public lands. And um, that's really a, a, a big deal for the rooster road trip. We'll get into that in a second. But mm-hmm. had you hunted the, um, the sharp-tailed grouse up in North Dakota before? Was this your first year? No, I've hunted them um, in North Dakota a little bit further north and west than I did this year. This year, uh, <clears throat> I, I generally hunt the Wisconsin rough grouse opener, which fell on um november i'm sorry september 12th this year and i about a week before that i went into the woods to do some some scouting and it was a mosquito filled jungle (laughs) and i i said holy cow this and i have a young dog i have a dog that at that time was about 11 months old and i just i thought to myself this is going to be really hard to watch gitchy my young pup work and i'm just going to get eaten alive and so I called my buddy, John Devney, who um, has a similar position as mine with um, Delta Waterfall in Bismarck. And I said, John, I only got the weekend, um, so I'm going to lose, you know, days on a license. But I only I want to zip up to North Dakota and go Sharpie hunting. What's the easternmost um, part of North Dakota that I can get into birds for, for basically the Saturday and Sunday? And he pointed me to that uh, Medina, Cleveland area, sure. um, about yeah. five hours from the from the Twin Cities. And so, uh, me and a couple of buddies zipped up there on a Friday after after work. Uh, we were there for Saturday morning sharpie opener, and the North Dakotans weren't real pleased because there were blue platers everywhere. <laughs> And uh, for <laughs> oh, folks that are, don't know what blue platers are, that's uh, Minnesotans were in full force in uh, mm-hmm. for, in North Dakota for the sharp tail opener. Um, so I, I began to see that what what happened in the spring as a result of the pandemic in terms of fishing license sales and turkey license sales was going to translate um, most certainly into upland bird say um hunting enthusiasm and in license sales and there was <laughs> it, it was it was way more hunting pressure than i expected on public lands for the sharp tail opener in north dakota but it was really really um beautiful weather good bird numbers and uh it was great to be starting the season yeah, I I can speak to that too. So a couple of weeks ago, I was out in Montana during the Montana pheasant opener and we were hunting public land and we actually were camping out there on the prairie and we were so, we were so far away from a town and the biggest town within 20 miles had, you know, maybe 250 people, 300 people in it, something like that. I mean, we were way out in the middle of nowhere and the night before opening morning, the roads were just alive with people driving and we saw license plates from several different states come by. Uh, Do you have any numbers as to, you know, licenses? Are they Mm. up that you can tell yet? Or do you have to wait on that information? Um, We have to wait a little bit on, on the information. I know that Minnesota um, they're up, um, I guess, marginally up. They're up a few percentage points. Okay. Um, I don't know across the belt, you know, or at least the primary pheasant range, how far up they are. But I know that uh, pretty much every single state, uh, based on the reflection of the um, roadside counts being up, 
that license mm-hmm. sales tend to trend with um, with numbers that go up and, and, and are reflecting that this year. Gotcha. Well, um, we're going to get into your rooster road trip in a minute, but you hunt a lot of rough grouse. I was just up north as well this past weekend. What's your take on Minnesota and Wisconsin, maybe even Michigan, our rough grouse numbers this year? Yeah. Yeah. I grew up in the upper peninsula of Michigan and, um, you know, that's how I frankly learned to hunt. Um, and there's nothing better, uh, than walking through a, a forest that feels like a bowl of fruity pebbles, you know, with all those <laughs> colors and the smells. And, um, so yeah, I, I love spending, uh, late September, early October, um, hunting the grouse woods. I've been extremely happy with rough grouse numbers everywhere I've been. I've, I've, um, and I've been to the edge of the boundary waters up by Ely, down to the North shore of the, of, of Minnesota. So between, oh, Grand Marais and Isabella, um, I've been to Northwestern Wisconsin. I haven't been to the UP, but my family still lives there. And then my brother is a, works for the U S forest service in, um, Rhinelander, Wisconsin. Okay. And I can say across the North Woods, grouse numbers are, are certainly up um, pretty significantly, I would, I would estimate. Um, I put it in the nature of 30 to 35 percent up compared to what I've experienced the last couple of years. It's been a very good rough grouse season. Timber doodle as well. Um, I, I, I walked uh, during my grouse camp the first week of October. I put uh, a group of six of us on either side of a gravel road, which is was really prime timber doodle habitat. But we came back to the truck in an hour and a half, hour and a half, so ninety minutes, six people, and we had over a hundred pointed timber doodles. Wow. For, in an hour and a half. So, you know, it was a combination of the right habitat, I think the right time of the migration. Now, as we record this today, you know, we've got in the Twin Cities a fresh, what do you think, six or eight inches of snow? I actually so, took, uh, I took Daisy out for a sunset walk last night in the snow, and I'm going to say eight to nine in the west metro of Minnesota area where I live. It's, it's ridiculous. I, it, <laughs> I love snow. I love all the seasons, but I'm pissed because fall is my favorite. And I feel like we've been robbed And the 10 day forecast shows more snow coming. And I'm like, we're <laughs> one week into our pheasant hunting season. This is not how it's supposed to go. Yeah. I, I, M- Meredith, my wife and I have a, um, a, a week's vacation next week to travel across northern Minnesota, doing our own little rough grouse trip, where uh, a cabin that we honeymooned in, and then uh, in near Park Rapids, then hunting two inlet state forests and the Bunyan, and then we're gonna move up the Gunflint and uh, stay up on Gunflint Lake at the end of the week. And we were the plan was this for this to be kind of the the halcyon days of October where it's 40 <laughs> degrees and sunny and, and clear grouse shooting. And um, it, instead we've got a winter wonderland out here. So it's going to be a completely different trip than we expected. Oh, uh, but but the, I guess the point of me bringing up the snow is I think, I think our, our timber doodle season is going to end prematurely, which is a, is a bummer because I think woodcock are the most under underappreciated upland game bird there is. I just love hunting them. I love eating them. And uh, I think that they're probably on their way to Louisiana now. Yeah, I think they're, they are based on uh, last night. I walked a piece of property that doesn't typically have uh, timber doodles and there was another young hunter that came out right at sunset too. And, um, I said, how, how'd it go? Any, any birds? And he said, no, but I did see two, uh, timber doodles out there. And I said, really? He goes, I don't know what they were doing. I have no idea. But I said, well, huh. it doesn't help that we just got, you know, eight, nine inches of snow. That definitely pushed them into an area. Bob, I got to get sentimental with you for just a second because I just got home a couple days ago from a trip that I have been dreaming about doing for several, several years. Um, I, 
I went up to our deer camp slash grouse camp, which is, it's a high school buddy of mine who has a cabin up in the woods in Northwest Minnesota. It's where we go deer hunting. Um, it's also where we do a lot of grouse hunting. And I brought my, my two boys and I brought Daisy. And then another one of my high school buddies brought his six-year-old daughter. And we just, we packed this truck full of everything so we could potentially grouse hunt, um, deer hunt, waterfall hunt, whatever it might be, but just to spend that time with the kids up at camp. They've got bunk beds up in this cabin. It's a very small cabin, but it's just perfect for kids. And the snow that landed in in most of Minnesota didn't touch us up there. We had those Mm. beautiful days that you were just describing. And we walked through the woods. My my kids um, and my friend Ryan his daughter, uh, Addison, she was right with us and just having, there was all five of us and we'd go for walks in the woods and we had the last morning, we, we, you know, we had to really, um, we had to really make for short trips because those little four-year-old legs do not keep up <laughs> with the dog and with us grown hunters. So they were small pieces, but the last morning, the last morning we went into this piece of public land and I've deer hunted it before. I've never walked it for grouse, but I remember specifically about five years ago, they logged it. And I thought, you guys, we have to go check this one piece out. And we pulled up to it and there was a grouse standing on the road. And I'm like, guys, if that's not a sign, I don't know what is. And we, we got out, we started walking and our, my kids, my dog, all of us, we got into just an explosion of rough grouse. It was the most picture perfect moment that a dad could ever draw up. At one point, we had, uh, fo- I think it was four grouse just went and exploded. And I shot one. And all of a sudden, you know, Daisy goes crazy. She's got birds in front of her and the kids are behind us and they're jumping up and down. And my <laughs> young child goes, dad, there's one right in front of me. And there was a grouse standing like three feet in front of him and it flushed. And so they got to, we flushed 15 grouse in a roughly 45, 50 minute walk. And we got three of them. Mm. And every, all the kids got to put a grouse in their vest. And it was just one of those moments that I'm never, ever going to forget. You know, you just like, you can't draw that up any better. And the, just the amount of grouse that we saw and the kids were so pumped to see <laughs> it. They got to experience it. Uh, it was, it's why, I guess it's why we hunt, right? Yeah, I mean, it, you, you'll never forget that, let alone it being a high point of the season. I mean, the age that your kids are, the age that your dog is. I mean, that's, boy. To, I, and I know, knowing you, you took some great photos that you'll have forever. Yeah, I, I tried to keep as many pictures as possible uh, and take as many without ruining the moment because, you know, that that's mm. one thing I'm trying to learn as a dad is, You know, when I grew up, my parents didn't have a phone that took photos. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was a, okay, we're going to stop what we're doing. We're going to get this camera out. We're going to take a couple pictures. Whereas I just grab it, snap it, keep walking and keep trying to record those, those moments, but Mm -hmm. also not ruin the moment either by interrupting it. So it's a balance, but certainly, oh, it was a special one. It's, it's a great season to be a, a upland bird hunter everywhere. Let's get into you guys' rooster road trip. So this year, well, take it back just a little bit. How many years have you guys been doing the rooster road trip? Yeah, this is the the 11th year of rooster road trip. So it's um, it's seen uh, um, a lot of different variations over time, but the, the premise has never changed. The premise being that, um, you know, we – when we dial it back to 2009, when when it, the concept came together, was we it, Facebook and our social media audience was kind of um, emerging, and there was this constant lament about there's no birds out there, and public land suck, and this and that, and it was sort of a negative perspective. And a Rooster Road Trip was conceptualized to to demonstrate that. You know, 
membership in Pheasants Forever leads to quality habitat and public land access. And if you're willing um, to go out there and, and lace up the boots behind a good bird dog and identify quality habitat, it, that it doesn't suck. It's the exact opposite. There's a tremendous amount of opportunity, whether it's pheasants, quail, sharpies, huns, you name it. Um, it's There's a tremendous amount of opportunity and birds out there. And Rooster Road Trip was um, our attempt to demonstrate that in real time through social media, originally directed at a little bit of a younger audience on Facebook. And, uh, you know, the first year we did it, we, we, um, we did five states in five days. And that might have just been a biting a little too big, a, taking a little too big of a bite out of the apple. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, we, we've done all kinds of different iterations and, and uh, it's been a responsible for, you know, roughly 300 memberships every single year and on the magnitude of $70,000 in sponsorships for a one week time period. So, you know, it, it's a really, really positive event in terms of just telling our story, but also hitting our bottom line to produce more habitat, which is ultimately our mission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this year you decided to go keep it all local, I guess, um, mm -hmm. probably the way to state that. Uh, what's the reasoning behind hunting Minnesota? Yeah, it, it, you know, the, we're, we're in the middle of a pandemic, which, yep. <laughs> which was uh, not something any of us could have predicted. So that was, yep. that was one of the factors. Um, and, and frankly, you know, the bird numbers, the way they are in Minnesota this year just exploded. Um, it's our home state. We just thought it was, it was a responsible decision to try to keep it closer to home. Um, and we also, you know, we hear the lament about there's no birds in Minnesota very often. And it's a head scratcher to me. Um, Minnesota is without question a top five pheasant state. But there's so many people that overlook Minnesota, both Minnesota residents and non-residents in terms of traveling. Um, and so, so Rooster Road Trip this year was a, um, an effort to be responsible and to highlight our home state. What did you, where did you guys start? Uh, we started down in Jackson County. Um, so on the Iowa border, we actually started within a mile of the Iowa border. And the purpose of that location was to hunt with um, a guy named Joe Dugan. And a lot of, a lot of your listeners will know, know the name Joe, uh, Joe's mm -hmm. name. Um, and, and the interesting thing is there's a lot of public lands out there, WMAs, WPAs, named in honor of conservation legends. And, and Joe is certainly a conservation legend. But the interesting piece is he's not he's not dead. He's, he's very <laughs> right. much alive. Thank he, goodness and for that. Thank goodness for him and thank goodness uh, for us. Yep. And so it's it's a it was a unique opportunity. Joe has a WMA and WPA that are connected, named in his honor for um, kind of the collaboration with the chapters in Jackson County and Nobles County and in, in, in Southwest Minnesota. And it, it was dedicated about a year ago, a little over a year ago. So we thought, what better way to kick off the road trip? than a person who conceptualized, Joe conceptualized our Build a Wildlife Area program. Joe conceptualized National Pheasant Fest and Quail Classic. Joe was intimately involved in Minnesota's legacy amendment and the amendment to protect hunting and fishing um, forever in, in the state of Minnesota. And, uh, so the road trip kicked off on the Joe Dugan WMA with Joe Dugan. And it only took about five minutes for the birds to be flying, which was just spectacular. Really, really. What uh, what were the bird numbers like down there? Yeah, I would say Southwest. I, um, I don't have the forecast in front of me, but I think the roadside counts were up 130 some percent this year. Jeez. And I would uh, I would say they're not off. 
Uh, I've, there were more birds in Southwest Minnesota than, than I have ever seen. Um, I, based on social media, my own social feeds, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Minnesota public lands, pheasant hunters are extremely happy. Mm -hmm. Uh, bird numbers have been spectacular. The other thing that's coupled with that in the Southwest is it was particularly dry the last couple months of the summer into the fall. So farmers have really gotten after the, the corn and bean harvest. It's probably on the magnitude of two to three weeks ahead of schedule in terms of harvest in the Southwest. So mm -hmm. Um, that just makes for bird hunting on public lands to be even better early season because those birds, you know, once the corn is out, um, those birds have, you know, that they're, they're pushed into the public lands, uh, grasses. So the bird numbers have been really good in, in the Southwest. And, and from there, we moved a little bit further West, um, similar thing. Bird numbers were excellent over, um, we moved to Murray County. And then we moved um, um, to Lyon County, all in the Southwest. And I'd say universally, bird numbers and harvest was excellent. And as we moved through the week, we, we moved north um, into West Central Minnesota. So Douglas County uh, on the far eastern edge to Stevens County, Stearns County, Pope County. Bird numbers, not quite as good as, as the Southwest. Corn also uh, probably 80% still in the field. So the bird numbers could be better there as the season progresses and the crops come out. But overall, um, Minnesota public land pheasant, well, Minnesota pheasant hunters, period, private and public land, um, should definitely find a good season in front of them. Um, just hopefully <laughs> some of this snow melts. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. Well, you, well, you and I, we filmed the show up near Alexandria a couple of years ago. That's, that's a little bit of a sleeper mm -hmm. destination for bird hunters. Everyone thinks you got to go south, you got to go west. The further south you go, the better. And yeah, there's, you know, sometimes that is the case. But what, have you, what are you hearing up in that central, west central, and then a little bit north mm -hmm. west Minnesota area? Yeah, I mean, if you follow the 94 corridor out of the Twin Cities through St. Cloud, through Sox Center, through Alexandria, all the way up to Fergus Falls, um, you know, it's it, it's a little bit of a sleeper to some, but there's an awful lot of folks that live in the West Metro that jump on that 94 corridor on Saturday mornings and, and head up that direction and, and hunt public lands. Particularly, there's a lot of waterfall production areas in that part of the state because of um, it's just a natural place with wetlands and, and a lot of ducks. Um, the, again, the, the, there's a lot more corn standing. It's been wetter up there than it has been in the south the southwest so it's a little harder to say exactly what the bird numbers are there compared to the southwest i think they're not there's no doubt they're not the same robust numbers that they are in the southwest so they're but they're pretty darn good and i would mm -hmm. say that those numbers are up over the where they have been the last couple of years and that's that's true i mean if even as far as fergus falls you know otter tail county um, the, the Pheasants Forever chapter in Otter, Otter Tail County just done a terrific job doing land acquisitions and, and buying land that is now public access. And there's a corridor there that, I mean, you can walk for miles and miles and miles of public land and, um, and see really, really surprising bird numbers all the way north into Otter Tail County. And, and I'd even swing, um, if you follow the 35 corridor up to Hinkley, uh, there's there's more pheasants in that northeast range than most people understand as well. The, the little bit more of a challenge finding public land that's farm country in that part of the state. But, um, uh, you know, Minnesota has a lot more pockets of pheasants than than most people realize. And you can find them, you know, within an hour of the Twin Cities. Now, granted, 
if you drive two hours, you'll find more birds. If you drive three hours, you'll find even more birds. But mm -hmm. if you only got a day, you can find pheasants within an hour of the Twin Cities. You can find rough grouse within an hour of the Twin Cities. It's, it's really underappreciated how much of a, a bird hunting mecca um, the Twin Cities uh, can be as a launching off point. Right, right. Yeah. And, and so one of the things that's interesting about that western part of Minnesota is that people in the metro area of the Twin Cities or even Wisconsin, when they decide I want to drive to that part of the state, they say, why don't I just go another one hour further and I'm into South Dakota or mm -hmm. I'm into North Dakota. And so a lot of the locals in that border towns <clears throat> of Minnesota, they say, you know, we don't really get that much pressure here because mm -hmm. people say I can just go 30 miles further or 60 miles further. And now I'm into South Dakota and they do that. And so those numbers from, I mean, you, you probably have this experience too, but the bird numbers remain pretty solid throughout the entire hunting season. Yeah, they do. And it, I mean, it, Let's face it, South Dakota is the pheasant capital of the country. There's there's good reason why um, people from Wisconsin and Illinois and, you know, even the Twin Cities just push that extra hour to get into South Dakota or or up to the north, uh, North Dakota. And you, you also get the advantage of adding Huns and Sharpies to the mix when you go to the Dakotas. So there's yep. um, there's reasons that the Dakotas pull folks um, and, and, you know, there's nothing like an opener in South Dakota. It just, uh, I mean, it feels like the Super Bowl comes to town, the, the welcoming of hunters in across the state and the kind of the festive, just the festival atmosphere, um, is unique. But, but if you do want to stay in Minnesota, like you, you mentioned, there's an awful lot of public land, particularly in the Southwest, whether it's WMAs, WPAs, or our wonderful walk-in access program in Minnesota is probably also another underutilized resource for public lands. Minnesota is, is, is really a gem uh, for pheasant hunters that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's just starting to get appreciated from non-residents, non right? Um, in the hotel in Jackson during the Rooster Road Trip, there was a group from Indiana and a group from Kentucky. Uh, and you really didn't, I, I don't recall seeing uh, Minnesota pulling from those sort of states to go pheasant hunting um, prior to the last couple of years. But you're starting to see a little bit more of that. Well, and I think part of it too is, you know, the information that is put out there. This is a prime example. We are talking to thousands of people right now, telling them what you just saw out in the field that they can go experience on their own. It's public land. It's out there for everybody to enjoy the, you know, the amount of information that's out there for the last, how many years have you been working at Pheasants Forever now, Bob? <laughs> um, I'm in my 18th year. So I start. Years. I started when I was twelve. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> wow! The first yeah, job 18, I, st <laughs> I started uh, January of two thousand and um, three. So, uh, yeah, it's um, <clears throat> it's been a long time. So most years you have to try to convince people, hey, it's not that bad. It could be worse. It could be worse. You know, like when we have those years where the grass is going out and we're like, no, mm. stop tilling it up. No, we had crappy nesting conditions. No, the winters were brutal, you know, and oh, we had a we had a hailstorm. You know, for once, we get to talk about a lot of positives. Is this a most exciting year? Obviously, non-pandemic conversation, but bird <laughs> conversations that you've been able to remember? No, well, I, I honestly remember really clearly um, the the falls of like 06, 07, 08, um, yeah. when South Dakota set 60-year highs. Minnesota was 60-year highs. North Dakota was like 40-year highs. It was, um, it was the best pheasant hunting of a generation. And right after that, and I could see it happening. I remember, I think it was the rooster road trip of 2010. 
um, we saw cattail sloughs being burned and, and just, it, it was, we saw the landscape being changed in real time, um, as, as, um, kind of, uh, the, the pendulum was swinging in front of our eyes in terms of grassland conversion to, to row crops at an accelerated rate. And, you know, I could, that was disheartening to see, you know, a 60 year high bird numbers just completely fall off the table. And, you know, working for Pheasants Forever, you know, organization that is our, our slogan is the habitat organization. Our mission is putting habitat on the ground for wild birds and, to, you know, benefits are beyond pheasants and quail. The benefits are reflected in pollinators and monarch butterflies and water quality and soil. And we could see as those grasslands were leaving CRP, you know, we lost 18 million acres of CRP in the span of like five years. And we could see the, you know, pollinators populations dropping and monarchs dropping and um, soil health deteriorating. And um, it, you want, people to rally during tough times uh, towards a conservation cause. Unfortunately, it's the opposite. Um, a year like this, when bird numbers explode, is actually when people rally to the cause and join the organization and the enthusiasm is there. So it's sort of a juxtaposition on what you think would happen. You know, when we lose habitat, actually people become a little bit apathetic and disconnect. Um, so a year like this, as you mentioned, where there's so much excitement around bird numbers is when we have to strike while the iron is hot and, and say, you know, we need folks to, if we want to keep this enthusiasm, keep these numbers up, we need you to join and become members. So when we go to, to Washington, D.C. and talk about the farm bill, we can we can talk about the increase in bird numbers and the need for habitat and water quality. So it's it's a it, it does correlate to um, kind of how the bird numbers go, uh, the organization and our habitat mission goes. So the the whole goal of the Rooster Road Trip is to gain that excitement and then add members to the organization, right? And so what can we do beyond that? What can anybody listening right now? do uh what's what's a good call to action for us to help support the habitat mission yes yeah, so, so obviously number one is we'd like you to join the organization you can go at pheasantsforever.org and there's a different membership incentives for you but beyond that uh, i think our listeners and members just bird hunters in general don't understand how powerful their voices to creating bird numbers. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you talk to a U.S. Senator or a, a U.S. Representative, they'll tell you that 10 personal contacts, whether that's emails, uh, mail letters, or phone calls um, about a specific issue that's personal, it, it, it's simple as, Hey, I took it, what you what you said with your boys, right? I took my boys um, bird hunting, and we found wonderful numbers, beautiful habitat, and it's incredibly important to me as a Minnesotan, as a North Dakotan, as an Iowan, to have wild places, public lands, and robust populations of wild critters. And because of that, please support conservation in the farm bill. I'd love to see 40 million acres of CRP. If you can tie that, your personal experience to who you are in your family, to the fabric of the culture within being a bird hunter and the need for habitat into a mm -hmm. personal message, 10 messages to a U.S. Senator can make a difference. So Absolutely. we just, we need to actually do something as bird hunters, we just can't, just, you know, can't come back from the field, clean our birds and, and think everything's going to be okay in the future. We actually have to step up and, and make the call, even in good times, and reinforce to Senator Thune, to Senator Klobuchar, you know, that 
these these uh these bird numbers don't happen by accident right right um a couple of months ago i had a listener of this podcast on the show uh he sent me a very touching message about his life story and we talked about it and we left that podcast with kind of a a message that or uh I'm not sure, not a motto, but it, when I, you and I, we've done, we've emceed Pheasants River Banquets and I kind of <clears throat> have the similar story that I've told a few times about my first time uh, being introduced to hunting and how that person basically uh, planted a seed in my soul that, that grew into something so much more. And Pheasants Forever is the habitat organization. So we plant seeds in the soil but us as hunters, you know, taking one, being the member, you mm -hmm. know, being a member of Pheasants Forever, but then two, taking somebody else out hunting right now to show them what they can see out there is a great opportunity to plant seeds in the soul too. So, Bob, I think what we need to do is, you know, you guys have all these creative t-shirts. I think one could be, you know, Pheasants Forever planting seeds in the soil and seeds in souls something mm. along those lines because we all have the opportunity to be mentors to first time hunters to new hunters. Am I onto something there? Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And I'll relate it back to, you know, if you go back to our website, click on the, the hunting tab and you'll see the very first um, uh, element of the navigation is take the hunter mentor pledge because yeah. you're absolutely right. Um, you know, we, we need a new generation of hunters to take up bird hunting for our conservation mission. And, it, and when I say new generation, I'm not just talking about youngsters. I mean, there's a surge happening, and I know you've seen it as well, um, surge happening amongst women, amongst folks of um, uh, diversity in ethnicities that – uh, expand from African American to Hispanic, Latino. Um, bird hunting is is growing, and we need to be more welcoming as a community. And mm -hmm. Pheasants Forever is is deliberately trying to be at the forefront of that. And um, and what Howard Vincent, our president and CEO, says often is, "Yeah, take your kids hunting, no doubt about that, but take somebody." Who doesn't look like you hunting we need if 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 we want a diverse um habitat landscape out there we also need a diverse uh landscape of hunters out there to to reflect the changing united states and if if we're gonna uh if the things we care about habitat and public lands if we want to to see that um, continue on in the future, we need an audience that looks different, thinks different, and, and is different than the one that brought us to this point. Uh, it doesn't mean that we step away from the groups that um, that have been the traditional bird hunters, but we certainly um, need to welcome everybody into the uplands. And so I, I am right on there with you. Um, Go jump on the, the website and take the Hunter Mentor Pledge because that's a um, no better way than introducing somebody out there. And it's like, as you've experienced, it's pretty darn personally gratifying too. Oh, absolutely. It, uh, it, those are the, my absolute favorite hunts. I've got a handful of hunters that have never bird hunted before that are on my list to take this season yet. So I'm looking forward to that. And I encourage other people to, you know, just pick one person. I, we worked on a project with the state of Minnesota several years ago, Bob. And the message that's always stood out to me is hmm. if everybody takes just one person hunting this year, one person, we can mm -hmm. double the amount of hunters in one year and double the voice of conservation. Let's yeah. uh, let's transition because I want to break down some of the other states that are now open to pheasant hunting or will be open very soon to let people know uh, what they can experience and expect. Uh, let's start with North Dakota. Uh, North Dakota is a presenting sponsor of this show, as many of you already know. Uh, their annual roadside counts for this year have been in for a while. I think that they were under the numbers uh, because of what I've seen out there, but pheasants observed 
per 100 miles are up 38%. I believe it's more than that. Sharp tails are up 54%. Again, what I've seen, I believe more than that. And Hungarian partridge are up 45%. I'm going to say that you could double that number based on what I've seen and what <laughs> others out there have seen. And with an estimated 4 million breeding ducks up 18% this year, North Dakota's central region is prime habitat for both hunting waterfowl and upland birds. Plus, North Dakota has more than 700,000 acres of private land open to public walk-in hunting. For the latest plots guide, visit the North Dakota Game and Fish Department or legendary ND. Dot com. I've been using Onyx Maps now for several years, mainly because I hunt a lot of public land in places that I've never hunted before. Onyx Maps give me peace of mind knowing that I'm always standing on public ground or land that I have permission to be on, and I can check my location while I'm walking in the field. They also reveal places that I can hunt when I'm scouting. I turn on the government layers in the state that I want to hunt, which essentially highlights lands that are open to the public. I start with a big picture view of the map, and then when I see the highlighted areas, I zoom in for closer look. No more searching slowly online for information or big bulky atlas maps. With the Onyx app, everything I need to know is right at my fingertips everywhere I go. That includes private landowner names in case I want to stop and ask for permission. Download the Onyx app right onto your smartphone and take it everywhere with you in the field. Onyx Maps are the best tool for every hunter. They help you to know where you stand. Bob, you've hunted North Dakota for sharp tails and you had a pretty good experience, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would agree with you that uh, North Dakota's um, roadside counts are probably underestimating the number of birds that are out there this year. And um, my social media feeds would confirm that too. It seems like uh, uh, North Dakota bird hunters are finding a tremendous amount of success. And, you know, if you think back, um, it was maybe three years ago, there was a really, really nasty sub September storm from mm -hmm. rain that rain turned to ice turned to snow i mean you, you probably remember those photos of telephone poles snapping by the dozens um and and that that particular storm was devastating for pheasants but um it's it's a few years in the rear view now and yep. pheasants are are nothing if not prolific breeders and they um they certainly feel like they're coming back and in, in, in force in North Dakota. And the, the other thing about North Dakota is historically, you think about North Dakota's primary pheasant range being 94 and south. And mm -hmm. over time, uh, pheasants, whether it's, you know, a changing climate, um, or also the the changing um, agriculture in that central and northern part of North Dakota, where it's it used to be all wheat and flax and um, in more small grains, it, you know, corn and beans have moved north of 94 and with it, pheasants have moved north. And uh, it, it does seem like there are more pheasants in more places of North Dakota than, than there have been historically. So, so I, you know, a good year for sure in, um, in, in North Dakota. Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm going to read you a uh, text that I just got two days ago from a friend of mine that's hunting in North Dakota. There's a photo attached to it, but the message says, North Dakota pheasant numbers are incredible. More like pheasant shooting than hunting. Hmm. I think that pretty accurately sums it up from what I've seen from my friends up there. Uh, we filmed a couple of shows in North Dakota already this season. And <clears throat> the the pheasants are almost like, all right, well, we'll go shoot our pheasants. But then you can also go for the Hungarian partridge because mm -hmm. the numbers of Hungarian partridge out there right now are just, I, I've never seen anything like it before. A lot of hunters that are hunted out there for, you know, a few decades have not seen it like this. Um, so the, the mixed bag potential uh, is, is really, really strong right now in North Dakota. Um, specifically my, my, uh, Intel is the Western half. <clears throat> I have not talked to a lot of people in the Southern half or the Eastern half of the state yet. Uh, I suspect there are going to be positive reports from that area as well. Um, 
you said that you hunted in western South Dakota. What was your experience like out there? You know, that's a be- it was my first time that far west river. Um it's just gorgeous and the amount of public land um out in that direction was was staggering. Um if you want to go for a big walk under big air, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a darn good place and uh you know there there's certainly it you know I was in that direction just south of Hedinger and uh and Mott yeah. You know, but on the North Dakota, I'm sorry, on the South Dakota side of that border Mm -hmm. and just it wasn't pheasant season yet. But and and I think the roosters knew that because they they were out of they were out of the side of the roads waving at us anytime you saw crop fields, um, you know, as we were going to and from a uh, grassier short grass prairie habitat in search of Sharpies. But it's uh, uh, another magnificent place to hunt upland birds. And, and that was so, a comment that somebody made to me here recently is like, you know, upland birds live in beautiful places, you yeah. know, and, and, and that really resonated no, no matter, you know, whether it's huns or pheasants or sharpies or rough grouse, you know, if you just stop and, and think about the beauty of the landscape and all these places that these birds live. And you've been fortunate enough to chase chuckers in, in some of the mountain birds. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, it's, you know, some of the best places on the planet to just spend some time, let alone to carry a shotgun behind a bird dog. Absolutely. Absolutely. South Dakota is interesting this year because for reasons that you and I I mean, you maybe can't speak to this or shouldn't speak to it, but I can. And I can say that I think it's ridiculous that they're not posting uh, a pheasant forecast this year, especially on a year when the bird numbers are up. I think it was a bad marketing idea. What's your take on, or can you speak to it, them not posting roadside counts this year? Yeah, it it certainly is a curious decision. Um, you know, they have all those decades of science-based um, monitoring of populations based on the roadside count. And as you um, accurately assess, like, I think we all saw the conditions shaping towards what would have been, if they had done roadside counts, a, a boom in numbers. So it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a head scratcher. Um, as to why they would abandon it, particularly in a year that probably would have demonstrated maybe as much as a triple digit increase in bird numbers based on, um, you know, the season is only, um, you know, a, a few days old at this point, but it seems like everybody is quickly reaching their limit of, of three roosters in South Dakota in the early season. And I'm sure the most of the corn is still standing, which is going to bode well for the rest of the year in, in, um, in what is undoubtedly the pheasant capital of the country. I mean, you know, it's, they, South Dakota hunters, um, will bag twice as much as any other state. Uh, so it's, it appears to be an epic year in South Dakota. Do you think that the numbers are a result of just more hunters and not more birds or is it that there are more birds in south dakota than the other states oh 100 percent. there's more there are more birds in south dakota than any other state i mean it's just you you can just look at the size of the state the amount of grass and um you just i mean their their entire population i think is under eight hundred thousand people so there's just a lot of space um do, do number of hunters influence bag um, bag numbers, yeah, sure. Har- harvest numbers, but uh, I still, you know, driving around South Dakota, gravel roads. I mean, you can just see the birds on the edge of the roads. Um, it just, mm-hmm. there's no doubt that South Dakota has more roosters than any other state, in my opinion. Hmm. Well, let's move to Montana. I was out there for their opening day and. We hunted a few days after that. The only negative thing I have to say about our trip to Montana was that the conditions were so dry and there was so much wind that the sky was just full of dust. And my Mm. eyes hurt after 
the day. Um, obviously, a lot has probably changed since uh, since we left that state. But one thing that didn't change, I'm expecting, are the amount of birds that we ran into. We hunted public lands again out there. Um, what do they call it? The block management? No, not not block. Is that what Montana is? Block yeah, management? Yeah, block yeah, management. Yeah, okay. Yep. We hunted block management land and you get into big sky country. Holy cow. I mean, there's some of the block management uh, properties, private land that is put into that open to uh, public hunting. But we're talking 10, 15, 20,000 acre chunks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's mm-hmm. just massive. And the bird numbers, again, I would say, you know, we hunted the eastern half of Montana. And the numbers were just phenomenal. We saw Mm -hmm. in any given walk, pheasants, sharptails, Hungarian partridge. Um, I highly recommend that somebody who's never experienced that, that kind of a hunt. It's, it's like a Western Dakotas type of hunt um, Mm -hmm. because you're away from a lot of the big city areas, a lot, you know, not a lot of population, out in a lot of those regions, but the bird numbers are really, really strong. Do you have any numbers from Montana that back up what I'm, what I saw out there, Bob? Yeah, I don't have any percentages for you, but um, you know, Montana, like most of the Dakotas, uh, or both of the Dakotas, bird numbers are up, um, and like what we talked about with North. Dakota that that snowstorm well rain sleet snow storm a couple yep. years ago impacted Montana as well there was also a pretty significant drought in Montana a couple years mm-hmm. ago that hurt uh, reproduction and and they've started to bounce back well they started to bounce back about a year ago and so they continue to climb the the thing about Montana it it probably oh, it relates back to one of your earlier questions about um, hunter numbers. There's there's far less number of hunters in Montana, so their harvest totals probably don't represent the the number of birds that actually are out there on the landscape in Montana. <laughs> it's an yeah. awfully big state with a, a really robust number of birds, but not a lot of bird hunters. There's a lot of people who go to Montana for elk hunting, but don't think about Montana for pheasant hunting. And it, it, it may not rival South Dakota or North Dakota in sheer number of population, but it, there's certainly terrific numbers. And I would argue there's no be- more beautiful place to be on a bird hunt, particularly as you get further and further west, um, you know, in, when you're in the shadow of the the Rockies and the foothills of the Rockies and 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 Pheasants Forever has done some really big public land projects out that way. Coffee Creek, Wolf Creek, Teton River wildlife areas. And you know if if you're a Pheasants Forever member listening, uh figure out a, a, a year to get to those public areas um, you know, circle them on the calendar and walk on those public grounds that you helped create because it'll be life changing. It's just, um, you know, it's, it's called big sky for a reason. And you put the, mm-hmm. it's that, it's that utopic, uh, moment we all dream about where our dog is birdie and a rooster flushes from grass in the shadow of a m- snow capped mountain. And that's attainable in Montana on public lands. And it'll be something, you know, in, in a February snowstorm that you, that, you know, when you're sitting by the fire, that you'll just kind of close your eyes and smile for the rest of your life. Because it, you know, we've all seen those photos in Gray's Sporting Journal or, or, you know, the Pheasants Forever Journal, and you can go do it. And it's on public right. land and there's birds to right. be had. It's just, it's so beautiful out there. Yeah. That's, you know, like the Western Dakotas and then Montana, just the amount of public land. I mean, when we were out there, there was no shortage of land. I mean, we, we pulled up the, like I said, the Onyx map and we were looking at different places that we could go in we could still be walking and still be walking and walk for the rest of the season and never touch the same piece of ground twice all on public land. And you can do it on a budget. Uh, you know, we did it, 
basically you just buy your groceries for the week. We ate uh, several meals of the birds that we shot, but I pulled my ice cast fish house camper out and we we camped out on the prairie. Um, you know, it's a few extra hours of driving. But like you said, that that picture is seared into my brain. And they were they were there were pheasants flushing out of a draw uh, in our first walk out there that I can still see because it was more like a covey of quail exploding. <laughs> but it was just, you know, these pheasants kept getting pushed and pushed and pushed. And all of a sudden the dogs went on point and they, we got up and one person kicked a bush and uh, I'm betting 50 pheasants flushed out of that one bush at one time. Mm. And you just, you dream of those moments. You just, it, it's spectacular. And I didn't even fire a shot and a couple of the other hunters didn't either because there was too many birds in one small area. They didn't want to hit any of the hens and mm. some of the roosters were young. And, but just the, just the potential that's out there. Let's switch to Iowa. Um, <clears throat> let's, and then we'll go to Nebraska, Kansas, Wisconsin. We'll, we'll work our way down. Iowa, uh, the opener is coming up. Same with Nebraska and Kansas. What are you thinking for Iowa this year, Bob? Yeah, Iowa numbers are up. Um, I think it's 18% um, year on year. Yeah, so mm-hmm. Iowa is surging. You know, Iowa went through a um, pretty um, significant drought in terms of, uh, well, tough weather and bird numbers were down. Um, for for an extended period of time, probably seven or eight years, but they were up last year and they're up another 18% this year. And if you look across the entirety of the range, uh, you know, the, the Northwest, the stronghold of, of the state in terms of pheasant numbers, up 16%, the North Central's up 7%, the Northeast is up 115%, the East Central's up 55%, the Southeast, is up 163%. So, I mean, if you look around, um, the state of Iowa is definitely surging back up in bird numbers. Um, that's true of quail as well. Quail have been up the last couple of years, maybe not up as high this year as they were last year, but um, Iowa has, you know, it, when I first joined Pheasants Forever, you know, 18 years ago, Iowa is where I learned to pheasant hunt. I had some buddies from the UP that moved to Mason City. They got a couple of jobs in the Mason City area and I'd go down and visit them and and I learned to pheasant hunt with them. And, and, you know, back in the day, Iowa was a million bird a year harvest state. Mm -hmm. And on the magnitude now, you know, they've been down in that 200,000 harvest. So they, they've, fallen really far off. Um, but, you know, this year they should uh, surge back towards, you know, 400,000 birds. Um, it, it should be a really, really fun year for Iowa um, bird hunters. Yeah, last season I hunted down there and I would argue that I saw more birds on on uh, the ground in Iowa than I did in South Dakota or Minnesota, uh, hmm. which... Yeah, it was good. And, you know, obviously there's certain areas that are always going to have a few more. And if you find that little pocket, that little honey hole, I mean, that can make your hunt seem a little better than the the average. Uh, a lot of times we get viewers that after watching the show, they're like, that's BS. I hunted, uh, I hunted Nebraska and it didn't look anything like that. And I said, I'm mm. sorry, we hunted public land. Those are wild birds. You saw what we captured what we videoed it was not anything uh, that you couldn't have done um so i will say there are the exceptions out there too but iowa no doubt uh i was you know jared wicklin and i we we were talking a few weeks ago about that being the sleeper again but it's not as much of a sleeper because the last so last two years have been so good people are are in on iowa the thing that might save those pheasants in iowa this year is just how darn good the numbers are in Minnesota, like you talked about in or in uh, South Dakota and uh, Montana as well. How about Nebraska and Kansas? Yeah, uh, Nebraska is up in, well, Nebraska and Kansas both are up in parts of the state and down in others. Um, they had a little bit drier summer than kind of the, the rest of the, maybe the Northern Great Plains um, or, or in, you know, as I think about the Dakotas, Montana, Minnesota, 
Up north, we had really nice wet um, spring that greened things up and helped produce insects, but it, those rains came before the, the nesting season. As I look um, to Nebraska and Kansas, it was a little bit drier, a little bit tougher conditions, and the bird numbers um, seem to reflect that to an extent. Now, if you look in the southwest part of Nebraska, which is where the majority of the public lands and the best pheasant and quail numbers are, the southwest part of Nebraska is up 47%. So, so pretty, pretty darn good. And, and that extends mm-hmm. into the panhandle, 36% up. But as you move east, the numbers are down a little bit. And part of that is a, a function of, of habitat and part of that's a function of weather. Similarly in Kansas, when you, when you look at Kansas, um, bird numbers are down a little bit, but it, you know, I, I temper that because Nebraska and Kansas both are, are still clearly uh, top pheasant and quail states. You know, that the mixed bag that you talked about in North Dakota, where uh-huh. you got pheasants, sharpies, and huns. Uh-huh. Well, the mixed bag of Kansas and Nebraska are pheasants, uh, quail, and then it, depending on where you are, prairie chickens. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a little bit different mixed bag. And, you know, whether it, it, you get into the competition between what's more exciting, a flush of a covey of Huns or a flush of a covey of quail. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, w- y- your answer to that, to that question will point you either towards North Dakota or, <laughs> or Kansas. Um, it, I really, really love um, kind of that corridor of Southwest Nebraska and and Northwest Kansas. A lot of public yep. land, not a lot of people, and um, pretty robust bird numbers year in and year out. Yeah, you you directed me towards Andy Hauser down in Nebraska a couple of years ago, and that's exactly what we experienced. But dog would go on point, and it's like, oh gosh, what's it going to be? You know, <laughs> after, after every point, you're walking up thinking, all right, all right, here we go, and it would be just an explosion of quail, or we even got chickens, and obviously a lot of roosters. And again, mm. again, I know we say it a lot, but all on public land, which was fantastic. Yeah. How about uh, Wyoming and Colorado? Yeah, well, so Wyoming is probably one of the most underappreciated upland bird states. Not not sh- yeah. not um, purely pheasant numbers, and, and they have pretty good pheasant numbers on the eastern side. But if you start looking at the number of, of different species of upland birds that you can hunt in Wyoming, it's pretty darn impressive. I do know a number of people that have had, uh, you know, that that's the destination for sage grouse. It's, it is to pheasants in South Dakota or what South Dakota is to pheasants, Wyoming is to sage grouse. Um, Colorado you know, that's also an underappreciated state. If you if you think about the folks in Denver, um, they got they can make a really long trip to get to southwest Nebraska, or they can hunt that what's called the Golden Triangle region of Colorado, which is um, Yuma to Holyoke to Sterling. And that area of the state is where the majority of the CRP um lands are there's there's a fair amount it's not huge number of public lands in that area but there's a fair amount and it's built off of those crp acres so um it's, colorado's probably a little bit better bird hunting state as well uh, like montana people think about it for elk and muleys but there's mm. there's more more pheasant hunting than most people would um, um expect it's on my list of places. I've got two different hunters that um, I may be visiting yet this year. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but yes, Colorado is an exciting place. Wyoming, um, I've, I've been fortunate to walk the fields out there for those um, sage grouse, like you mentioned. I believe 45% of North America's sage grouse live in the state of Wyoming. I believe mm-hmm. that's a 
pretty accurate number from my research. Uh, and I've experienced it. It's it's a phenomenal place to be. Obviously, the sage grouse se- season is closed right now, but there are a lot of birds out there. And just the, the sheer amount of hundreds of thousands of acres of land, again, that are available, uh, make it a destination. Now, let's go east a little bit to locations that uh, don't really have that massive public mm-hmm. land opportunity and unfortunately that results in a few less birds as well how about wisconsin and illinois yeah yeah definitely um overlooked uh but wisconsin if you think about the the west central part of the state uh, just across the border from the twin cities there's a fair amount of public lands and and more pheasants than most people anticipate and you know there's a lot of people that live in that hudson area work in the twin cities and just keep their mouth shut (laughs) about (laughs) about the number of birds uh i I know a a number of folks that just were out in wisconsin for their opener last weekend and had very good success the other part of the state of wisconsin um that's that's good for pheasant numbers is down in that south um east corner uh you know along um oh uh, south of, of madison um there's a farm belt there that uh, has always been a stronghold for pheasant numbers as you move down into illinois just across the border um you know that i guess it'd be uh west of rockford and north to the wisconsin border pretty strong uh, bird num- pheasant numbers more than most people expect um, out of out of a state this the, with a population the size of Illinois. It's actually the third largest pheasants forever state in terms of total number of members. And uh, I'll point people to a, a brand new article that's in the the Pheasants Forever Journal's fall issue, where our editor uh, went hunting. Uh, I think it was five different counties of Illinois and. Um, just had an amazing number of uh, pheasant and quail um, uh, experience there. It just an amazing number of bird numbers um, mm. it, based on what people would expect. And then you bounce a little bit further to the east, my home state of Michigan. The, the stronghold of, of Michigan for, for bird numbers has always been the thumb of Michigan, north of Detroit. We, you know, it, you know a Michigander when they hold up their hands is a map of the state. Uh, but if you you think about uh, your right hand, uh, looking at your right hand, um, the thumb area um, is where the majority of the public lands and, and the best bird numbers are in, in the state of Michigan. And then it, it, as you drop down to Ohio, uh, just kind of a Cliff Clavin statistic for you. Um, <laughs> There's a there's a county in Ohio just south of Lake Erie. Um, I think it's it's Sandusky County, if I'm recalling correctly. But that county has the highest number of pheasants on record um, by population density. Now the, the that statistic comes from the '60s before kind of land use changed and agriculture really intensified, but it, it what it demonstrates is the carrying capacity of the soil as you move east. You know, it's the soils of Iowa and Illinois and Indiana and, and, and Ohio are so rich, um, and it can carry so many critters on them. If if you can create the habitat, the birds can really respond. And in Ohio is another state where you know it probably doesn't draw a whole lot of people. Uh, from a traveling perspective, but the locals that, you know, when, that work as chapter volunteers and put in so much time and effort to produce public lands and quality wildlife habitat on those lands, they actually shoot a few more birds than um, a lot of us recognize or realize. Well, that's good. Another Cliff Clave, in fact, I believe Sandusky is also home to a certain Tommy boy from a few years back. <laughs> <laughs> I believe, I believe. Don't call me on that, but I'm pretty sure when I heard Sam Dusky, that's the first thing that came to mind. Uh, well, there are certainly regions that we, we have missed here, but uh, I think that's a fair 
overview of our pheasant forecast this year. Bob, what advice do you have for hunters that want to get in their trucks and travel to any of the locations that we just talked about or some of their own? Well, you know, first of all, you can go on the Pheasants Forever website under hunting. There's a state by state forecast that we put together. And, um, you know, our editors talk with all the, the upland biologists for each state. So that's a good place to start to narrow down what state you want to hunt in. And then, you know, I would correlate back to, to one of your title sponsors of the podcast, Onyx Maps. Once you've identified a state in a particular region, then jump on Onyx and, and start looking at those layers of public lands, walk-in lands, and narrowing your focus on, on where you're going to go. You can do so much scouting from your, your Barca lounger these days, and, and that's an attribute of Onyx that didn't exist really 10 years ago. Um, so, you know, those are a couple of really, really important tips. Go to the website, figure out what state you want to go to. You know, figure out what birds you want to chase. What's the mixed bag that's going to energize you? What's the landscape that's going to energize you? And then jump on Onyx and narrow down to a particular region. Absolutely. And one other thing on top of that, I mean, I agree with all of that information, is, um, but also you have a lot of your uh, pheasant forever biologists, quail forever biologists listed on your website. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of talking with people um, and it's, it's pretty helpful to be able to talk with somebody in a region. They're generally going to point you in the right direction as to, you know, how would steer here because we've had this. Talking with people that are on the ground living in an area, if you're traveling from across the country, is a really helpful way to kind of put yourself in a good position. I wouldn't expect them to say, go to this GPS coordinate, there's a covey here, and I don't think anyone should expect to receive that information. But it's helpful to talk with with people that are out there so that's a that's something that i talk about on this podcast quite a bit is just how helpful of a resource your biologists are that are out there um any any further thoughts on on their uh what they try to do for you and for hunters bob Oh yeah, that that's a great recommendation, Travis. And you can um, you can find it real easily under the conservation tab. Um, it's I think sixth or seventh down on the navigation. It's called Find a Biologist. It's as simple as typing in your zip code or the zip code where where you want to travel to, and we have over four hundred uh, biologists that are employed by the organization, and that's. I'll repeat that again. <laughs> we have over 400 biologists that yeah. work for this organization at different levels, you know, with uh, from government affairs to regional field directors to farm bill biologists. So it, it, it demonstrates that we are a science based organization and that's where we come at our habitat mission from. But yeah, it, it, click on the, the find a biologist tab. And they're just wonderful women and men. Um, most of them uh, are as enthusiastic about bird dogs, wild meats, and, and public lands as you are. Um, and and they, uh, they absolutely um, help point you in the right direction. Bob, I appreciate you taking the time. It went a little longer than I was anticipating, but there's so much information to cover. And I feel like we probably just barely scratched the surface here. So hopefully we can do this again. What are you, last question here, what are you most excited about for the rest of this hunting season? <laughs> well, thank you very much for, for having me on. And I, I do want to recognize, you know, we have such a long, um, wonderful relationship with with Ron Share Productions, with you, Travis, with, with Ron, with, with Scott, Scott with Bill, um, it, it just been such an advocate for our conservation mission in our organization, whether that's the, the Flush television show, Rooster Tales, this podcast, um, helping bring our habitat mission to the masses is so critically important. And, and you are such an unbelievably positive representation of our organization as, you know, we don't have quote unquote ambassadors, but if we did, <laughs> you'd be one <laughs> because you just, you, you just, you represent us in the ethics of the outdoors. So, so positively. So, so thank you so much. Uh, in terms of what I'm Hold looking Hold on. I got to give you a little hug here. I'm, I'm yeah. hugging you. <laughs> you like Through that? The, the, the little mic, virtual. Right? 
<laughs> yeah, virtual um, hog. Thanks. Yeah. I appreciate uh, appreciate those words. Uh, it was um, it, they're they're absolutely hundred percent true, and um, um, we couldn't we couldn't achieve the great things without your ability to help us reach new audiences. Well, thank uh, you. You know, in terms of what I'm looking forward to, it's it's I I love those landscapes that I've talked about. Um, you know, thinking about Montana and the beautiful scenery when the birds flushing, and those are uh, those are the moments I'm chasing. Not and it's sort of you know irregardless of the state because you know you can have those beautiful moments in any state with any sort of backdrop, and I chase those moments. It, very specifically, what I'm excited about for the rest of the season is the development development of my youngest of three short hairs, um, a pup that's just turned one. Uh, her name is Gitchy Gumi, named after my love of Lake Superior, and uh, <laughs> just you know, I she's but the fourth bird dog I've had as an adult, and you know, I've talked about it on other shows and podcasts my wife and i have never been able to have kids and enjoy that component of of the bird hunting experience so i live through that piece of it vicariously through through bird dogs and and watching a young dog go from a puppy to an adolescent to to start figuring things out as a is a full-fledged bird dog um is just some of the most rewarding and joyful moments of my life. And you can look back, um, if you look back at roosterroadtrip.org, which was um, the kind of the micro site of the trip, Gitchy, um, I think on day one, had our very first ever wild bird retrieve. Though I talked about you know, hunting North Dakota and Ely and South Dakota. And she's been pointing pretty good. I mean, she's young. She's, she's had some points under her belt, but she really hadn't retrieved. And the first day there was a uh, Logan Hinners, one of my coworkers, Yellow Lab was close to a bird that got dropped. Get she got there first in that competition for the retrieve. Um, it, it kind of fueled Gitchy to to make her first retrieve, and it was a, oh, awesome. a wonderful moment. And then two days later, um, there was a shot over a wetland that a rooster was dropped in. You know, in the field at that moment was Gitchy and a really young Springer and a French Brittany, and and there wasn't the lab or the natural water retriever. And, um, Gitchy at you know, just a, a year old, um, went for a blind. She didn't see the bird fall. She went for a blind water retrieve on a rooster as her second retrieve ever. And if you watch that video, you'll see me kind of come unglued with joy. <laughs> and, oh, I bet. I bet. It was, uh, it was just, um, something that I'll cherish forever. So I, I really love the connection that upland bird hunting brings um, no doubt to people, you know, I, I share the experiences with people, but, um, I have a real, real passion for the connection with dogs. And, uh, um, that's, that's what I'm looking forward to spending more, more days in the field with, with or without snow, uh, with, the, with my pup. Right. Well, I, I hope Daisy and Gitchy get to share some time together in the field yet this season. I know we've got a lot of time left out there. Um, and I echo pretty much everything that you've said as well on that and uh, with my pup too. It's it's an exciting time. Uh, we're thankful for just the opportunities that we've got, uh, the places we can hunt, and the fact that bird numbers are up this year. Bob, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for everything you do for Pheasants Forever, for Upland Bird Hunters all across the country. We really appreciate it. You, uh, in my opinion, I won't, you won't, uh, agree to this, but you've always been kind of the voice of pheasants forever, in my opinion, because you just, you, you live it. Um, you're so vocal in so many different places and, uh, you're so positive and helpful to all the hunters out there. So I speak for all the hunters when I say thank you very much for all that you do. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. It's, um, it's not a job. It's a lifestyle. Um, mm -hmm. I, 
I live it, I breathe it, I care about it. And, and I guess my final comment is, you know, all, you know, that we have so many, we have 130,000 members and within that there's 4,000 chapter volunteers that I, I am one of the very few fortunate folks that gets paid to, to work for Pheasants Forever, but there's 4,000 Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever chapter volunteers that are working with landowners, working with state agencies, holding mentor hunts. And the chapter volunteers are the unsung heroes of the conservation movement, and very specifically Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever. And um, I can't thank them enough. And, and I'm honored and, and to be a representation of, of what they do from, you know, from Lyon County, Minnesota to Lewiston, Montana, to, you know, Pennsylvania and everywhere down South in quail country. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think about them every time I jump on a, a interview like this, because I know I'm, I'm representing um, volunteers. So thank you for the kind words and the opportunity to, to spread the habitat message, Travis. Really yeah, and hey, <clears throat> the work is uh, coming to life, as they say. Uh, the birds are there. It's a good year to be out in the fields. Bring somebody new with you this uh, this season and let them experience the, the rush of the flush. Once again, I want to thank North Dakota Tourism for helping us make this show possible. To beg your limit this fall in North Dakota, visit legendarynd.com. And don't forget to download the Onyx map to help plan your hunting adventures and find those pieces of property that are open to the public and full of wild birds. Current episodes of the Flush Television Show are airing now on the Outdoor Channel. Catch the action every week, Monday, Tuesday, Friday, and Saturday, now through the end of the season. For more on the Rooster Road Trip, head to pheasantsforever.org. To watch past seasons of the Flush, head to theflush.tv. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Flush Podcast. Podcast.